Uh, today we shall be completing um, the data structures portion of this course and we will then embark upon looking at applications of data structures and that will uh, comprise of sorting algorithms and then a fair amount of, of the rest of the lectures will be on graph algorithms right so that's a whole new topic but you'll see how data structures can be very usefully used in both of these applications. Before we do that, let's complete our discussion on hash tables by looking at performance of hash tables. So um, in the last lecture, uh, we were looking at the following scenario. We said, well, let's start by looking at chaining and let's see if we can compute the time complexity for the chaining scenario. All right. Um, and here's the analysis, because it can be a little tricky to be able to compute that, and it's sort of a probabilistic analysis. So let's assume that we have uh, the number of elements as n, as we did earlier. So we have n elements in a hash table of size m. All right. So the first question is, what is the average number of elements per index location? Or you might refer to that as per bucket. Okay, so for each one of these, uh, in this case, for example, let's say you have you know, a size of 10, a table of size 10, um, and let's say you have uh, three elements in it. So what is the average size or average occupancy for every location inside the hash table? Fairly straightforward, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's simply n upon m. All right. So n upon m uh, is simply the number of elements per index location or per bucket, as you might refer to that. All right. Um, now the question, the next question is, how long would a search take? So now remember we're doing hashing. So how do we do the hashing? We initially calculate the hash function. That takes constant amount of time. All right. So if you might say the order of complexity is initially one because we're computing the hashing function and then we get to that particular location and we're doing the chaining analysis so now we have to see how far down the chain the linked list we have to go and how far would that be how far down the chain do we have to go on average Yeah. Right. So the worst case is big of n. What about the average case? Um, think about what we just discussed. Yeah. Brian, is it? Yeah. It would be O of one, but what if I'm not restricting N and I'm saying N could be hundred and M could be 10. We're saying the average size of the linked list is N upon M. So what is the average number of steps that you would have to take? Yeah, N divided by N, right? So we're saying that, you know, let's say that the average size in this case is 1.5, okay? So you basically go N upon M steps. On average, not the worst case, but on average. Does that make sense? So initially do a computation, the hash function, and then you get to that particular location, you go down that uh, series of linked lists on average n upon m steps. Okay, but let's say that um, n upon m is now fixed. Okay, we are now resizing. So we sort of guaranteeing that as the hash table becomes ingested for the chaining case uh, let's say we are taking the threshold to be one so as soon as you hit n upon m is equal to one you resize now we're doing a search complexity so we're not looking at the time to do the actual resizing assume that that is already done so um, if n upon m is now guaranteed to be at most one then the complexity of a search would simply be one plus n upon m and now n upon m is guaranteed to be less than one less than equal to one let's say so 
in any case that comes out to be order of one complexity on average okay yes yes if you are resizing so as long as you're doing resizing we the the internal function will ensure that as soon as you hit that threshold you're going to resize okay so um so the complexity for chaining comes out to be big o of one um for probing uh we are saying that n upon m is even smaller all right so remember we said that the thresholds for uh, probing would be slightly smaller because it has a very hard it's it's a closed uh, it's a closed scenario okay so in any case even if it was one or less than one or even if it was two doesn't really matter as long as n upon n has a bound as a constant bound then the search would simply take order of one okay so that comes out to be the complexity for doing a search okay so um, in chaining we have uh, order of one order of n to do a search but now let's take think about uh, insertion okay so let's think about insertion i showed you a glimpse of the next slide but um assuming you didn't see that let's think about insertion so chaining versus probing okay with resizing so things are becoming a little bit more complex all right we're not just doing hashing but now we're also doing resizing okay so if you're doing an insertion what would be the worst case complexity so let's say you do an insertion in the chaining case you say well uh, let's say um we insert at this particular location so let's say we and we're adding bob over here all right and that should take a constant amount of time to do the insert, but at what? Uh, all right. That is still implied that the insertion would take constant time. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So you may have to resize, right? So in the search, we didn't have to do a resize, but when you're doing an insertion, it's an area list, presumably, underneath. And so you may have to resize the hash table. And we know that implies that you have to not only copy all, you have to first of all create a new array list. You not only have to copy them, but you, for each copying, you have to actually calculate the hash function. All right? Um, and so that would take big O of n. Okay, so an insertion would be a big O of n simply because underneath this there is an array list that has to be resized. So, whenever you're talking about resizing, the worst case is going to be big O of n. Okay, now uh, in this scenario, I said that this is the average scenario, but um, um, you can also say that if you have a good hash function, then you can assume with a very high probability that it's going to result in a very well distributed um, insertion. Okay, so if you, for example, if you're using double hashing, we've already seen that. So if you're using a good hashing function, which presumably we always will, then that's going to result in a very well distributed uh, insertions. So you won't have the scenario where all of the elements are in one long um linked list okay so this can be thought of as the worst case as well okay so if you're doing a good hashing function then uh in, even in the search scenario it's going to be big of one however in the insertion is going to be big of n simply because you have to resize okay now let's think about um insertions for probing if you're doing an insertion in the probing scenario, you're already assuming that we're resizing. So um, n upon m is going to be bounded by some threshold. Um, 
what's the insertion complexity, the worst case. Is it going to be similar or different to what we just saw in chaining? So, so how is probing working? Basically, you calculate a hash function and you go to a particular location and you say, well, uh, let's say you're trying to insert some other name starting at C, right? So you're inserting Cindy, but well, Cindy is already there, but let's say we're inserting some name CX, okay? So now um, we're already guaranteeing that uh, N upon M is going to be relatively small as compared to the upper limit of one, okay? So it could be 0.75, it could be 0.5, it could be 0.6. Now, without proving this, I'm going to tell you that the average time to actually do an insertion is going to be bounded. Why is that? Because um, if it's a good hashing function, there will generally be spots not very far away from where you're trying to insert, where there will be an empty spot. Okay, so you won't have to go all the way around the array. Okay, you'll probably go one, two, three, four, five steps, but it's not going to be very big simply because we're assuming that it's a good hash function. Okay? And you are ensuring that n upon m, that means that maximum 75% of the slots will be used up, 25% will be available. So those 25% of, of the empty spots in the hash table are going to be spread out fairly uniformly. So you generally shouldn't have to go too far to be able to do an insertion. Okay, So um, insertions were fine. Uh, in terms of actually finding the location, but then what is the other problem? What is the other problem to this? Just like in this particular case, that underlying it is a hash table. And if that particular element results in the uh, threshold being crossed, and all of a sudden you've inserted uh, n such that n upon m is now bigger than 0.75, and all of a sudden you're going to have to resize. And that's going to take a bit long. Okay. So insertion, uh, wherever you have hash tables, uh, where, sorry, wherever you have an array list uh, being used, regardless of which data structure you have, it's always the worst case is always going to be bigger of n. Okay, worst case. So insertions um, are in both cases are going to be bigger of n. What about deletions? What about delete star? So let's say you've actually found what you're looking for. So you found Charles and you plan to delete Charles. How long would that take? Yeah. But if you delete Charles, say that again. Yeah, so, so remember, you have to resize both at an upper threshold and there's also a lower threshold. So if the low threshold is crossed and now because of that deletion, you have to resize and make it smaller. So that's going to result in order of n. Okay. So even the delete star is going to be order of n um, for chaining. What about for probing? Yeah, exactly. So it's the same thing. So as soon as you found what you're looking for, you delete it and n upon m goes below that lower threshold. So you have to resize. Okay, so both delete star. Uh, so here we have these results. Uh, now we're talking about with resizing. So we've just seen the following scenarios. We said that if you are inserting, then um, insert for both the cases, it's going to be bigger of n. Uh, if you're doing a search and you have a good hash function, then uh, even as I said in the example of probing, uh, you won't have to go too far. Okay, so you won't have to go all the way around simply because you've got a well distributed ha hash function. There will uh, you you're ensuring that maximum of let's say 75% of the slots are used. So you will you may have to go a few a few uh, you know indices down, but you won't have to go all the way around. So uh, you can say that, you can see that in both of these cases, you're going to be seeing big of one uh, complexity. Delete, however, simply because it's going to be resized, 
in all of these scenarios, you're seeing a resizing, so you have a problem. Okay. So um, now it doesn't look very good. I mean, we thought hashing was really good, but it seems like it's not so good, right? Simply because the only thing it's good for is search, but if you're doing insertion or deletion, you have a problem. And you already saw that it's no good if you're trying to do, um, you know, trying to do an NQ or DQ for a priority queue. So we, we discovered that. So what is it good for? Well, remember our amortization. Okay. So now, um, you know, it's not always good to look at the worst case, as we discussed earlier. Uh, generally, it's a good idea to look at averages. And amortization has already shown us how to do this. And we discussed this earlier already. Okay. So we know that if you're doing, if looking at the amortized, amortized average, if you're working with an array list and you have to resize, then the order of complexity is order of one. Okay. And even if you're doing a resize and you're making it smaller, uh, that without actually going through all the, the entire process, you can take my word for it, is also going to be big of one. Okay. So resizing amortized averages are order of one. And we've already seen that earlier. So now if you include that and you say, well, what about the averages? And by averages, we are going to be assuming that we're talking about amortized averages uh, in this course. So uh, in that case, what happens? Resizing is not a problem, okay? If resizing is not a problem, then all of a sudden, all of these worst case scenarios um, actually start looking pretty good, okay? So worst case is up here, and this is the average scenario. And we're saying that um, here, you have these four scenarios where uh, because of resizing, you have problem but if now you look at the average based on amortization then you simply have a tremendously positive result so this is sort of an important point the important point if there's one point in this course where you know you, you your eyes should open you would say wow all right so this is the point so now you've got a data structure which can actually do all three of our critical operations that we started off at the beginning of the semester in big of one time on average. And that's pretty good. Right? You don't have to necessarily look at the, the worst case. Um, so um, at this point, you might say, well, uh, if hashing is so good, then what about the other data structures that we, that we looked at? Right? I mean, why did we study heaps and, um, and AVLs? Well, heaps have their importance because they're good for priority queues. And you know that priority queues, uh, hashing is no good for priority queues. But what about AVL structures? I mean, uh, what about BSTs and RBTs and AVLs, which are balancing um, uh, BSTs? So what about those? Do we simply discard all of that knowledge? Probably not, right? I mean, we spend a fair amount of time discussing those. So there's probably a reason why we discuss those. Um, so any thoughts? Why do you think? Um, an AVL or an RBT would still be useful. So this is where you sort of look at the big picture and try to think, putting different data structures together in one perspective and try to think what are the pros and cons. So now you have to think about applications. Can you think of any applications where uh, hashing may not be looking so good? Okay. And let's now take a look at the following scenario. So this is something that we've already seen before. Okay. So this is uh, heaps and balanced BSTs. Okay. So we saw those earlier. All right. So you have your heap structure right here. You have your balanced BSTs. And now I'm trying to compare that with chaining and probing. Okay. So you've seen, and what I'm doing is I'm putting a slash between the worst case and the average case. So where you see uh, two numbers appearing, then it basically means that in the insertion for heaps, remember that we said, because it's resizing, it's going to be worst case is big O of N. The average case is going to be order of plug N. The search for heaps was always big O of N. Why? Because heaps are essentially partially sorted. 
it's not BFC. So you have to go through the entire um, entire tree. Deletion, the worst case is big of N because it might result in a resize, but on average, we've already seen that it will be an order of log N. Okay. Uh, for priority queues, this is a great structure. Okay, why? Because one of the things that we saw is that the, uh, the build time complexity is big of N. And um, the worst case for doing a DQ and NQ is also guaranteed to be order of N, order of log N. Okay, um, I have that wrong over here. So the worst case in both of these is also the, that's, that's the average. And these mistakes always crop up in these slides. So the worst case, uh, sorry, so the worst case is going to be order of N. Why is that? Because uh, they have to be DQ, they have to be resized. Okay. Otherwise, it's going to be order of log N on average. Uh, balanced BSTs, we saw that they're really good if you're talking about insert, search, and delete. But um, not so good as far as build is concerned. Okay, so we've gone over this portion earlier. Hopefully, you recall these results. And now we're talking about chaining and probing. And I've just shown you that the worst case on the average is as follows for insert, search, and delete. Okay, now um, we can also take a look at these. All right, so any thoughts on if you try to use hashing? for a priority queue implementation, would that work out at all? Could you use uh, hashing for priority queues with any luck? No, and why is that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so in hash uh, in hash table, there is no relationship between the location of entries, right? So in order to do a DQ of the maximum or the minimum, we'd simply have to go through the entire table. Okay, so that's no good. Um, so if you look at the following results, um, this would certainly be big O of n. Okay, to do a DQ, simply because you would have to go through the entire hash table. Okay. For an NQ, uh, again, uh, the, the insertion might be quick, but uh, the the, uh, the deletion um, that, that the well the insertions uh, would would result in a worst case of order of n for an average big of one, uh, and the same. And essentially, if you look at these two scenarios, these are identical in terms of performance on in terms of big O complexity. Okay. Um, what about build? Can somebody sort of justify why I put a big of N for a build in, in hashing? So what are we doing in build? We're basically saying all of the elements are available to you. So you have N elements. Now you're trying to build a hash table with that. How long should that take? Right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, what about resizing? Did you have to resize? Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah. 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 So, because you already know how many elements you're supposed to add, and that's what build means, remember? So in a build, you already know you have n elements, so you don't need to resize. Okay, you simply start off by setting the using the threshold, and if you're doing probing or chaining, you would use the appropriate threshold, and you'd say, well, if I have 100 elements and I'm doing chaining, then I can simply take a hash table of size n, of 100. Okay, and I simply insert those using a hash function, and you know that's going to take order of n time. Okay, so you don't have to resize. Okay. So that's the reason why the build operation in both uh, of chaining and probing is going to take big of n. Okay. Uh, we've already seen why this would be big of n. 
simply because um, you can't do DQ and there is no relationship. So you simply have to search through the entire hash table to be able to find the largest or the smallest element of DQ. Um, if you're doing an NQ, the worst case is that it would have to be resized, okay, both of these cases. But on average, it's going to be order of one. Why is that? Because we're talking about amortized values. So it doesn't really, the resizing doesn't really matter. And so when you're doing an NQ, either in chaining or probing, it's going to be a constant time, as long as, you, as you're doing resizing. So, we, so here, in these two scenarios, we're going to be assuming resizing. Okay, and that's what the estimation uh, comment over there entails. Okay, so this is sort of uh, a good point to sort of try to see, well, which one of these uh, data structures would be used in what scenarios, okay? And um, you can see that in some of these, uh, for the priority queues, uh, which one would you use? You certainly can't use uh, hash tables, the priority queues, simply because of this particular problem, right? There is no relationship. But uh, we've already discussed this, but just a review. If you want to use a priority queue, could you use a balanced BST versus a heap? We could, but there is a little bit of an advantage for a heap simply because it's using an array list, right? And a balanced BST would be using arrays. So, sorry, would be using pointers, okay? And if you're using pointers, then you're obviously going to take up, you know, the constants associated with the log n are going to be larger, okay? So the heap is going to be much easier to implement and have lower constant. So we've already discussed this. So uh, for, as far as the priority queues are concerned, uh, heaps are great. Um, as far as doing insertions, search and delete, it seems like if you're talking about averages, then hashing would be the best way to go. All right, we're talking about averages. So where does our balanced BSTs come in. Can we see any use for balanced BSTs anymore? They're no good for priority queues. Um, they're not the best. They're being superseded by hash functions for doing the usual insert, search, delete. But can you possibly think of as an application where um, balanced BSTs might still be useful, even for your insert, search, and delete functions? Yes. Okay. So if you're doing a lot of insertions and deletions, then, um, well, even then, uh, on average, hash functions are superior because insertions and deletions in BSTs are taking order of log n, versus on average, um, hashing is taking big O of one on average. So can you think of an application where you're using numbers a lot? Okay. I'm not quite sure uh, where that is coming from because regardless of whether you have, you're dealing with numbers or you're dealing with a string, to compute a hash function is going to be a constant time operation, okay? So you know, numbers versus strings or objects, uh, the hash function is going to be equally good, at least in terms of complexity, yeah. Okay, yeah, I can see that. So depending on your application, so here is a general way of thinking, thinking about this. If you are running a real-time application, okay, so imagine that this um, application is actually being used inside a self-driving car, right? You are going, 
and you see a red light and the car is supposed to stop, right? But all of a sudden, the information that's coming in requires that the table is to be resized. What's going to happen? It's going to take a huge amount of time. It's going to be an order of N operation uh, in that particular scenario. So an average your car runs fine. It goes through all the green lights and red lights. But on that one particular day, uh, you went through, you're going through a particular scenario, and all of a sudden you're seeing a resizing happening. What's going to happen? You're going to go through the red light, you might actually, you know, have a major problem. Okay? If you get a ticket, it could be a lot worse. Okay? So, in all real time applications, you need to worry about not just the averages, but you need to worry about the worst case. So, if you are running uh, an application which is a real time application, it will be safer to go with the balanced BSTs, even though the average performance for a hash is a lot superior, which is big of one as compared to a balanced PST, which is order of log n. Okay. But at least uh, you, it's predictable. Okay. Um, and you have this unpredictability whenever you're using an error list. And you don't want that kind of a situation coming up in, if you have a real time application. Okay. So now you can see that, you know, all of these have their pros and cons. But there is uh, one thing that seems to be, there was a question earlier on, um, and that is, I mean, why are we using probing versus chaining, right? So we come back to that particular question. And it seems like probing and chaining are performing identically um, in terms of the, um, the complexity, but uh, what seems to be the difference? And can we just uh, think about is, you know, the threshold for chaining is superior in the sense that you can have a higher threshold before you resize. Uh, probing doesn't look so good in that respect. So why uh, do we need to worry about probing versus chaining? What could be the pros and cons over there? So it's clearly not in terms of the complexity, okay? Because in terms of the complexity, the big notation, they're performing identically. So now we're looking at something a little bit, you know, slightly different maybe in terms of the constants, or maybe in terms of something else. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you might say that um, in chaining, you're actually using two data structures. Okay, so you not only have the, the array list, but you also have to have um, a, a linked list, okay, so it's more complex. So you might be able to summarize this as follows, and this is some of these results I'm not really proving to you, but generally chaining has been seen to have better worst case performance, okay, so it seems to be good. Uh, it also performs better at higher load, we've already seen that because the threshold uh, is higher for chaining versus probing, however, uh, it does require this additional linked list, okay. So that's a bit of a um, uh, you know, trade off. In probing, uh, it, it, it requires additional complexity due to clustering. So you know that you've got to implement double hashing. So uh, if you have a problem and you have communications, you've got to have that cluster, and then you've got to have you know, some nice complex uh, hashing function to be able to avoid the clustering issue. Um, it's also more complex okay, to be implemented because of the resizing. So underlying there is a resizing issue uh, and you have to actually copy everything, okay? Um, however, uh, but, but of course, this particular issue is also there in, in chaining because you would have to resize that, all right? But in general, it requires less memory. And why is that? It's simply because the linked list has pointers. So it's the fine print, right? Um, there are some advantages to both of these. So if you are concerned about memory, you would go with probing. Okay. So if you want to make it something um, you know, simple and you don't have to worry about two data structures and have to worry about you know managing a linked list, uh, then uh, probing works fine. Okay. So there are some fine uh, differences between these two. So this sort of uh, brings us to the end of our data structures. Okay. 
Okay. And this is an important table because it basically, uh, you know, summarizes most of the results, uh, not for stacks and queues, but uh, for pretty much everything else that we've discussed. This is a good point to, to review the entire course up to this stage. All right. So now we will move on to the second part of this course, which is talking about applications. Okay. And the first application that we will start talking about is sorting algorithms. Now, uh, sorting algorithms is something that we've sort of uh, perhaps thought about right from the stage where, you know, in the first or the second lecture, where we were saying that, um, well, if you're trying to search, uh, what is the first algorithm that we thought which operates, you know, in order of login? I think that is in the second lecture. How could we, yeah, binary search. And what did we say about binary search? We made a big assumption. We said that if, if the data, yeah, is sorted, right? So right away we're saying that if the data was already sorted, we didn't say how it's going to be sorted, but if it was sorted, then we could do a binary search. So you can see that um, having data sorted is extremely important. And you know you deal with it every day. Every time you open your your phone book or something, it's all alphabetically sorted, right? Uh, or your phone numbers or what have you. So sorting is one of the important uh, applications that is used throughout computer science. All right, very important in computing in general. Um, now, in sorting, um, what we'll see is an application of data structures. Now we'll see several sorting algorithms. Some of them have nothing to do with data structures. Those will be starting points. So we'll say, well, let's assume we run the data structures first. Let's see how we can actually do some sorting, some simple sorting. And then we'll finally say, well, what if we try to use some of the data structures that we've already studied? Can we improve on the results? And interestingly, yes, data structures does help. Okay. So let's take a look at how one could sort. And for now, for the next few moments, we'll forget about data structures for a while, okay? So let's think about how, if you had a bunch of numbers, okay, in a really simplistic way, just, you know, maybe cards, uh, nothing to do with computer science, and you had to sort these, okay? So imagine that these are pieces of paper that you have to sort. Uh, how would you actually go about sorting them? Any any algorithms that might come come to your mind? Okay, they don't think about computer science for a minute. Okay, so somebody who's on the street and you ask him or her, you know, we have a bunch of numbers. How would you sort these? And we do this quite often if you play cards. Right, you have a deck of cards and you need to sort them. So how do we do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, that, that's a great algorithm. So you could say, well, uh, 64, you compare these two, and you say, well, 25, you're trying to sort with the, the largest number on the right. So you say, well, let's move 25 over here. And uh, let me do that at the bottom. So you move 25 here, and you move 64 here. Okay, and then perhaps you do the same thing. You compare 64 with 12, all right? And you say, well, 12 should go down, 64 should go up. And then you keep on going in this direction. Is that how you do it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you'd have to do to go through it multiple times, right? Because uh, we already see that even though um, these two are relatively sorted, but over here we have a problem, right? Twenty-five is still bigger than twelve. So you'd have to go through a second iteration through the entire process. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so in that sense, you you would have to first of all say which is the highest or which is the lowest, right? So in that case, so that's an alternate. So these are two algorithms that we write about to study in the next few minutes. Okay, the first one is called bubble sort. Okay, what you just suggested that's called bubble sort. Basically, you're doing a comparison. Okay, and you sort of doing a comparison with neighbors, and you you swap them. They're in the wrong order, and you go through the entire list once, 
and then you do the, the process again. Okay, that's public solved. The other one that you've just suggest, suggested is saying, well, what if we go through this entire process and we find the largest one? Okay, and then we put it at one end. And then we go through it again and find the second largest one. And then we put it at the second last one. Okay, and that's called selection sort. Okay, so these are two, the, roughly these are two algorithms, but let's take a look at them more closely. Okay, so the first one is selection sort that we'll study, and then we'll talk about bubble sort in the next month. So selection sort basically says, well, we will um, separate this array into two components. Okay, we'll say, well, this is some portion of it will be considered as sorted, which I'm showing you in a green box, and the rest of it is unsorted. Okay, so consider the array in two parts, sorted and unsorted. Initially, everything is unsorted, so there is no green box over here. The second step is select the smallest element from the unsorted array and, and swap it with the leftmost unsorted position. Okay, so now we're going to go through this entire array. And let's, I didn't say this, but let's assume that this is in some kind of an array, maybe a static array. Okay. So we're going to go through the entire array and we're going to look for the smallest chap. We find that 11 is the smallest. So what are we doing when we're doing the comparison? We probably have a variable which says this is the current smallest one. And we initially have the variable saying 64 is the current smallest one. And then we go to the next one and say, well, 25 is smallest. So now the smallest number is 25. Then we say the smallest number is 12. And then we say the smallest number is still 12. And then we finally get to 11 and we say now the smallest number is 11. So now we found the smallest number. And what do we do? We swap it with the first location. Okay. So 11 comes up here and 64 goes over here. One iteration done. And then we continue on from this point onwards. Okay. Increase the sorted array portion. So now the sorted array portion is increased. And now we're going to repeat this entire process for the rest of the unsorted array. So what do we do now? We look for the smallest number. So we look at 25, this current smallest. No, 12 is the smallest. 12 is still the smallest. 60, uh, 20, 12 is still the smallest. So now we swap 25 with 12. Okay. So now this portion is sorted and this portion is unsorted. So you can see where this is going, right? Now let's try to compute the complexity. And we look at the worst case, the best case, and the average case. Well, the average case is generally difficult because it requires probabilistic analysis. So we simply look at the worst case and the best case, okay? So let's think about the worst case first, right? What is the worst case performance in this scenario? Yeah. So O of n is one answer. Um, any second thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the first time around, you're going through order of n, n steps, right? The second time around, in the second iteration, you're going through n minus one steps. The third time around, you're going through n minus two steps. Why? Because you've already sorted this portion, so you're only going through the rest of it. So the number of steps is going to be a sum of n plus n minus one, okay, plus n minus two, all the way up to one. And does anybody know what that sum leads to? Sorry? Factorial, did you say? Factorial is when it's multiplied. It's not as bad. Factorial is like to the power n or something to the power n. So it's not as bad. But yes, the answer is order of n squared. But why? That simply goes back to you know your your math. So if you do the sum, it comes out to be n times n minus one divided by two, some equation like that. But basically, it's an order of n squared. Okay. So this comes out to be order of n squared in the worst case. Okay. It's simply a sum of all of these. What about the best case? Yeah. Okay. So um, that's a great idea. How do you actually know that it's sorted? 
So what you're doing is you're looking for the smallest number, right? Okay, so let's assume that these are already sorted. So uh, we have one, two, three, four. Let's say we're sorting these numbers, right? So now what we're doing is we're looking for the smallest number in the first iteration, okay? You find one, you say, great. But we had, we had to do n steps to be able to figure out that one was in fact the smallest, the first number. Yeah, it's still n squared, right? Because the, the, if you look at the operation, uh, we're saying, well, one is still, you don't have to swap anything, but then you start for the rest of it and you say, well, let's take a look at two. And two is still the first element every time is still the smallest, but you don't really know that it's sorted, right? Unless, unless you modify the algorithm, all right? You could modify this and but that would be implying a modification of the algorithm. So the original algorithm by itself would still be, even in the best case, would be order of n squared. Even if all the data was already sorted, we still are going to n and then n minus one and then all the way up to one. Okay. So this is obviously not a very good algorithm, right? N squared um, in, in both of these cases. Now, we're also going to look at, when you talk, talk about sorting, we're also going to look at the space. And there are two ways to look at space. Um, and we're going to classify the algorithms as in, in space or using more space, okay? So if the algorithm is not using any additional space which is proportional to n or which deals with n, then it's going to be using you know, it's going, it's going to be using, it's not going to be using additional space. Okay. So the question here is, uh, how much space how, is it using additional space, which is proportional, which is a function of n? Is it using additional space, which is a function of n? It could be using some additional space, but those could be fixed. And maybe they're not proportional to one. They're not, they have nothing to do with n. How much space is this using? So basically what we're doing is we're using the array and we might have a cons we might have a variable which is being used to figure out which is the smallest number, but that has nothing to do with n, right? That's a single variable. And we're doing swapping within the, the array. So we're not using a whole additional array, okay? So this can be thought of as in place. So it's really good in terms of using space, all right? Um, so I've already gone through uh, this case that you are talking about, you know, even in the best case, it's going to be uh, taking order of n squared. On average, uh, I'm not gonna do this analysis, but um, you can see, you can perhaps guess that it's going to be in between these two, which obviously is order of n squared as well, okay? And in terms of space, it's considered as in place, which basically means that the amount of space that you're using is a constant. So the only thing that's going for this algorithm is that it's in place, okay? Otherwise, uh, it's pretty pathetic, right? It's just taking order of n squared time. All right, so uh, that's what we normally do when we, you know, if you have a bunch of cards, you might be doing it that way. You're looking for the smallest number, you put it in front, and then the second smallest number, you put it in front. But you can imagine that, you know, the deck of cards, that's fine. But if it's something bigger, it would be a problem. Now, let's think about the second, the, the other algorithm that is proposed, which was bubble sort. Okay, so this goes back to one of the suggestions over here, which basically says, well, let's look at adjacent elements. And if they're not in the right order, we'll swap them. And then we'll continue going on all the way till the end. And then we'll come back and do the whole process again and again and again until we've done it enough times. Okay. So here's this algorithm. Again, it has a sorted component and an unsorted. So the green box is shown as the sorted component. We start from the first element over here and we compare adjacent elements and you swap as necessary, okay? So we compare 64 with 25. Well, 25 clearly is smaller, so you swap it with 64, then we go forward, okay? We compare 64 with 12, 
So 12 is clearly smaller, so 64 goes up. So you can sort of see that the largest element is sort of being picked to go all the way to the right. Okay. The largest element, which is 64, is sort of slowly being moved all the way to the right. And as soon as you end up with the last comparison, the largest element has been selected and is on the rightmost slot. And then we're going to repeat the whole process again. But this time, uh, we may not have to go all the way to the end. All right. So we're going to again compare 25 and 12. 12 comes up here. Now we sort of pick the second largest number, 25. As you can see, 25 is slowly drifting to the right. But we don't necessarily need to go all the way to the last part. Why? Because now we only need to go to the unsorted portion. And every time we're doing one iteration, the sorted portion increments. Okay. So uh, we're increasing the sorted portion and we're repeating all of these steps until we're done. So what is the worst case complexity in this case? What's the number of steps the first time around? It's basically n or n minus one we're doing comparisons. All right. So as you go down this entire series of steps, this entire series of steps is basically n equations. Right? You're comparing, um, you have n elements, and maybe you're comparing them n minus 1, but roughly n or n minus 1. Uh, the second time around, you go through one less equation. So this becomes n minus 1 steps. And you can see again where this is going. So it will be simply again a sum of n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 all the way until the entire, uh, the entire array is sorted. Okay, so that gives us the same result, which is order of n squared. So average, uh, you can just take my word for it, is also going to be order of n squared for a typical distribution, you know, randomly distributed. But let's not talk about that. What about the best case? Imagine that all of these numbers are already sorted. One, two, three, four. Okay. So now is it still going to be order of n squared? Or can you make a almost a trivial modification to the algorithm and convert that into a better complexity? And what could be that trivial uh, modification to the algorithm? So we start off, we say, well, is uh, one and two, we compare these two, uh, one and two, and no swaps required, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So if, you, uh, if you're going through this, in the first iteration, if you don't find any swaps, and that would be easy, that would be essentially part of the algorithm, right? You're simply doing a swap, and you have another flag which is true or false and says, was the swap done or not, okay? So if at the end of the entire iteration, you didn't do a single swap, then obviously that implies that the entire data is already sorted. So that's almost like a trivial modification, and that would result in the best case, which would be considered as order of n. Okay, yeah. So, four, two, three, and what was the example again? Five, seven. Okay, so some portion of it is sorted. Two, three, five, seven uh, are almost sorted. Uh, four is out of place, right? So, can you come up with a different algorithm, or are you saying that? within bubble sort, can we sort of make a small modification and come up with a better uh, complexity? Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so let's take a look at this particular example. So four would come up here and two would go there. All right, then you compare four and three and you realize that three goes here and four comes up here. And then you look at five and seven and you say no changes, no changes. And essentially in, um, in one iteration, you have completed the job, right? But, um, but do we know that do we know for sure that that is the right complete that we've got a sorted list? We can see it as humans, right? But in terms of the algorithm, can you see whether is there some criteria that you can use that would say that we don't need to iterate any further? So you've got a great idea, okay? And that sort of relates to what the average scenario is going to be. Okay, so on average, some portions of this array are going to be sorted, some portions are not. And the question is, if it's, if it's randomly sorted, and some portion is, you know, 50% of it is sorted, 50% is not, what is the average complexity? Okay, so that's a more complex analysis. But it can be shown that on average, it's still going to be order of n squared. Okay, but that's, a, but that's the right way to think about it. Okay, and that way you can actually come up with your own algorithms because you're trying to see well uh, in what scenarios can you actually improve the algorithm. Okay, and that's great. So, um, so unfortunately, in this case also, the the average uh, is is order of n squared, but the best case has improved. Right, so the best case with a very trivial modification is now superior. So now we started with selection sort, uh, bubble sort seems to be superior, but what about space? Is it in place or not? Is it using additional space, which is a function of n? No. So it's again in place. So it seems to be superior to selection sort, right? Because um, you've got the following scenarios and uh, it's also in place. Okay, so the best case has been improved while the worst case, the average and the space requirement is essentially as bad or as good as selection sort. So we're making improvements, okay? So these are two uh, fairly straightforward algorithms that you, know, you don't even need to take a computer science you know, algorithms course to be able to figure those out. You, know, you could just think about them and it's kind of obvious. But now let's take a look at more advanced algorithms where we basically look and try to see if the worst case phenomena can be improved. An order of n squared, as you can imagine, is really bad, right? Uh, order of n was bad enough, but order of n squared is, is far worse, okay? So now we're going to take a look at another algorithm, um, which is sort of a generically referred to as um, a divide and sort, uh, sorry, a divide, a, a divide and conquer algorithm. Okay, so there are a whole bunch of algorithms which uh, try to divide the problem into small portions and try to resolve those small problems. Okay, um, can you think of any algorithm that we saw again going back to our first few lectures, which can be thought of as divide and conquer? Yeah, recursion. Okay, so basically, what we're doing is we are, uh, when, whenever we're doing a recursion, we basically say, well, in order to solve this problem, what we can do is make it slightly smaller and keep on iterating until we actually, rather recursing, until we get to the base case and then we move backwards, okay? So that's a great example of divide and conquer, okay? Um, I'm not saying what the complexity is of those scenarios, but let's think about an algorithm that we just thought of a little while earlier or doing a search in the second lecture, which was the binary search, okay? In binary search, what are we doing? We're saying that we're assuming that the data is sorted, but now in order to be able to search through that, we say, well, let's start from the middle and we compare the number that we're trying to search for, whether it's smaller or bigger uh, than the number that we found in the middle, and if it is, either way, we divide up this search space into half the size, and then we simply have to work on that particular half. And then again, we go to the middle of that portion, 
and we say, well, is it to the left or the right? And then we divide the search space into half again. So every time we are going through a binary search, we're dividing up the search space into smaller and smaller portions. So it's sort of like dividing it up and then conquering that particular part. Okay, so that's sort of a general way of thinking about it. And so quicksort is sort of similar in that sense. Okay, it's going to divide up the space into smaller portions and then try to resolve those smaller portions uh, separately. So let's take a look at this particular algorithm, uh, which is referred to as quicksort. It's a little bit complex, but uh, hopefully uh, in the next few minutes, you should be able to get your handle around it. So what it's going to do is it's going to use the first element of the array, and we're going to call that the pivot. Okay, so it starts off, takes the first element, and it calls it the pivot. I've shown that as a yellow, it's shaded as yellow. And then uh, it, it goes through the rest of the array, and it compares these values with the pivot. And every time you come across an element which is smaller than the pivot, you swap it. Okay, swap it with what? Let me show you. So um, I is the location, is one location, which is where the pivot is. And well, let's just forget about I and, I and J. Let me explain this to you in general. You go through the first element, the second element, you look at eight, and you say, well, uh, eight is not smaller than four. So you disregard this, you go to the next element, seven is not smaller than four. Then you go to the next one, you find two is smaller than four. Okay, so we're going to swap two with eight. All right, so the element which was next to the pivot. So eight goes in two's location and two goes in eight's location. All right, we continue on from that point onwards. So we continue on from this point onwards. We say, well, is six now smaller than four? No. Is one smaller than four? Yes. So now we're going to swap it with the next location. Okay, so one goes in the location of seven seven is uh, moved up to uh, one spot we continue going onwards from this particular location nine is not smaller than four five is not smaller than four zero is smaller than four so we're going to swap zero with the next location eight okay so if you look at the next slide we uh, swap zero over here um and then we continue on from this point onwards is three smaller yes three is also smaller than four so now what you see is that all of the values which are smaller than four are now all the way on the left side. All the elements which are bigger, and we're assuming distinct values, all the elements which are bigger than four are to the right side. Okay. But are these elements sorted themselves? No. So all the green elements internally are not sorted. It's simply saying that they're sorted with, with, with respect to the pivot, okay? Um, so that's what we've initially done. The next stage is that we want the pivot to be in the center, okay? Another way of thinking about this is an example that I'd like to give is that uh, imagine there are a bunch of kids in school and the teachers just ask them to get sorted in the order of height, okay? You want the left, the shortest kid on the left, the tallest kid on the right. Okay, so now one possible way that the kids could do this is that each person looks on the left and the right and says, well, um, I'm perhaps in about average in height, so I'll sort of go to the center of the room, okay, and then the rest of the kids say, well, okay, am I taller than this kid? Uh, if they are taller, then they go to the right of that kid, the shorter kids, kids go to the left of that kid, okay, so you can think of this initial gap as a pivot. So what he or she has done is he's anchored himself, they've anchored themselves in the middle, and all the kids which are taller are now on the right, all the kids which are shorter are on the left. The kid, the, this chap, is now in the right location. Can you see that? Okay. So this person doesn't need to move any further. But the question is, how do we get the pivot to be in the right location. So we've done the initial portion. Now we just need to make sure that we get the pivot to be in the right location. So how could we get the pivot into the right location so that the pivot doesn't have to be worried about in the future? Yeah. 
swap, uh, swap it with the middle. Okay, so what we could do is we could take four and swap it with three. Okay, so three comes all the way here and four comes here. So does everybody see that? And once we've swapped it with this chap over here, this three, then four, the pivot, is now in its perfect location. Because all the elements to the right are bigger, all the elements to the left are smaller. Okay. Uh, is that the best way of, of getting the pivot to the middle? Could there be another way? What if I suggested that let's move each one of these guys by one so that four, four goes in three space, but two, one, and zero are shifted, each one of them are shifted by one. Does that make sense? Or that, would that be worse? So let's say I said, well, we could have two, one, zero being shifted, and then we have, sorry, two, one, zero, three, and then four, which is the pivot, goes over here, and the rest of the elements go in here. Is that superior or what you suggested earlier? Is simply to swap four with three. Yeah? Exactly, exactly. So I want you guys to think about that, you know, because um, just to make sure that you guys are awake. So obviously, uh, swapping makes more sense. Okay. Uh, if you didn't swap and you shifted them, there was no point in shifting them simply because they're unsorted. All right. So there, there doesn't need to be any special relationship between two, one, two, one, zero, and three. Okay. So now we have the pivot in the right location. We've swapped pivot with this middle chap. And we have three over here, uh, and then two one zero are in the original location. Four is now in the center, roughly in the center, and the rest of the elements on the right are bigger than the pivot. Okay, so that's the first iteration. And how long would that take? What's the complexity of the first iteration? We've started with the leftmost. We've selected this as the pivot. And you simply said, well, we're going to go down and we're going to do some swaps. So what's the complexity? We go fan. Yeah. So all the way down uh, to get to this stage, it's simply we go of n. All right. Now the question is, what have we achieved? Well, remember this is uh, divide and conquer. Yeah. Yes. We've got a good uh, intuition over there, and but we need to figure that out. Okay, so um, so now what we're going to do, as you can imagine, is now we're going to use divide and conquer. Okay, so now we've divided up this problem into two smaller operations. The left portion four is in the right location. The pivot is in the right location, um, and now we need to sort. The left half and the right half. So it's sort of similar to a binary search. Okay? Sort of similar. Uh, however, how is it different from a binary search? If you think about at this stage, in binary search, we also divide it up into a small portion, into a left and right. And here we're also dividing up into two parts, smaller and, uh, yeah. Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, exactly. So in binary search, we said, well, we're looking for an element. And now uh, it's either in the bottom half or the top half, right? And so now we have to disregard one half and we've reduced our search space by half. OK, in this case, can you do that? No, we need to sort the entire thing, unfortunately. Okay, so now we need to sort the left portion as well as the right portion. So the complexity is different from a binary search. Okay, and that's why the gentleman over here mentioned that it's going to be n log n, but let's figure that out. As opposed to a binary search, which is, which is what? Just log n, okay? But here you can already see there is a difference. And when you do uh, 550, you'll actually figure this out why it's, mathematically why it's different. But here we, we sort of do it in a simpler way. Um, 
So let's take a look at now what the complexity of this is going to be. So the first operation was n steps. What is the complexity of the second step? Now we have two halves. Each one of them need to be, we're going to recursively apply the same algorithm. So now we're going to say, well, this is the entire array, so to speak. And so we're going to select three as the initial pivot for the left half. We're going to apply the same algorithm. And for the second half, we're going to use seven as a pivot and we're going to use the same algorithm. Okay. So now what's the complexity of the second phase? So this one can be thought of as order of n. Yeah. So is it half of n? Uh, this is half of n, right? But then this is also half of n. So it's not just half of n, it's two times half of n, all right? So two times order of n upon two, that basically becomes that it's essentially n, okay? We're just doing this half, which is n upon two, the other half, which is n upon two, and those two added together are essentially n, disregarding the pivot. Okay, um, so it doesn't seem like we've achieved much. Okay, we've just divided up into a more complex situation and we're still doing n operations. Okay, now what happens as you go forward? What about the next stage? So this is this can be thought of as two times n upon two. Now imagine that n was 16. So now we've divided up into two times 16 upon two, right? So two times eight. This is also 16. In the next stage, what's going to happen? We're going to divide up into small portions. All right, so this is going to become smaller. And so instead of um, 8, we're going to have 8 points. So let's say this becomes 8. This becomes 8. So this is going to become 4 and 4. And this is going to be 4. And four. So it's going to be four times four. Right? Again, 16. So what's the point of all of this? Yeah. Exactly. So ultimately, this number over here is going to be equal to one. For in the next stage, it's going to be eight times two. And the next time it's going to be 16 times one. Okay. So each one of those iterations is going to take 16 steps. But so what was the point? What is the point? Yeah. How did you get n log n? That's my question. <laughs> Uh, we're looking at the, the worst case, so it's not looking at the best case. We I mean, had the right intuition, but we need to figure out how we're getting n log n. So we have n steps, okay, then n steps again, and then n steps again. But how many times do we have to take n steps? What do we need to multiply n by? by? Are we doing n iterations? Or are we going to be doing fewer iterations? Yeah, somebody? How many iterations are we going to be doing? So each time we're dividing it up by half, right? So 16 becomes 8, and then it becomes 4, and then it becomes 2, and then 1. So how many times did we have to do, uh, so how many times did we have to repeat the entire process? Five times, right? And so 5 is what? is sort of like a log n operation right so if you had if you had one more step let's say you had 32 uh, of these you would have to take six steps if you had 64 of them you'd have to take seven steps so you can see that there's a log n coming in 
all right? So the number of times that you have to repeat this process is now log n. So now that's where you get the result of n log n.